we had to do a topic on a dying craft. So um, I looked for a lot of topics and uh, through that journey I found this one. And the reason why I chose this topic was because um, it's mostly done by the women artisans and I, all this time like I had just heard of like men craftsmen like in India and maybe there are other women craftsmen in different parts but uh, since I had also studied in Meghalaya so uh, this story was like it felt like it should be told and uh, mostly because of the mother and the daughter's relationship and the grandmother also so yeah I wanted to tell this story. It's it's beautiful and the music. Uh, uh, yeah, so the sound designer is also a local um, uh, sound uh, sound designer from Meghalaya, and uh, we initially we had used a Western type of music, but it really wasn't going with the visuals and the story. So we uh, decided to add the local instrument called duitara uh, that the locals use. So uh, that music uh, fit in really well with the story. Yeah. It's really, really nice. It's very impactful. You know, filming a craft, the challenge of filming a craft, if you want to talk a little bit about that and uh, come to you also about it. I mean, mostly uh, the main problem that I faced was the language barrier. But uh, luckily, um, my cinematographer was also from that place, so he knew how to communicate with them. And um, the thing about their craft is it's very seasonal, so um, uh, we couldn't shoot when uh, they get the raw materials, so I had to use animation to show those parts. Uh, yeah, that's the m only problem. Very clever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Utpal, uh, do you want to talk about, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the island of Majuli a little bit, but also the story that you tell through your film of, of of this community, this family, and and this, I think it goes back to 15th century. The right, the the and the mass. I mean, I before I saw the film, I had no idea the mass was so elaborate and it's so intensive, right? The making of it. So, so but also do talk about the 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 challenge of filming a craft because there's a lot of mundane stuff, right? Mitti gholna or ye sab karna, usko shoot karna. Like how how challenging is that? Uh, thank you, Suparna, and uh, I must thank Village Square for organ organizing this beautiful event. And I really feel privileged to sit between a living legend and a very young, talented filmmaker. So it's uh, really a privilege. Yeah, coming to your question, yeah, uh, see, Majuli, as we know, it's uh, considered to be the world's largest inhabited river island, and it's now a district. Uh, it has been a district since last maybe five, seven years or so. And uh, it's I can say it's almost a almost hundred percent green district if we talk in you know environmental terms because people still live in the original kind of very sustainable living with the nature kind of thing. Every year it goes and large parts of it goes under the water, right. but people live with it. It is also the place where one of the major tribes of Assam called Missing Tribe they live and they are water people and they, their houses are all on stilts and they are very, I mean, all the time they are with the water. Even their houses are always on the, you know, river bank, right. mostly. So, uh, coming to this craft of the mask, uh, it was first propagated, first initiated by the great uh, 15th century saint, Vaishnavite saint and social reformer, playwright, and he was much more, Simanta Sankar Dev. Uh, so, he started this uh, kind of dance, drama style of play uh, called Bhavna, so where he first used the masks. So the masks are all made using uh, all organic material. Now of course there is a little bit of inorganic material coming in, in terms of the paint because earlier uh, the, the, even the paint was made from various you know organic material like there was a kind of uh, stone, soft stone in Assamese it's called Hemul Haital. Uh, uh, what I came to know during my research is that some of those stones were bring, brought in from Rajasthan in those days and it was ground and that colors were made. Plus it was mixed with a lot of other, you know, natural colors like uh, turmeric and various plant, plant uh, seeds and all that. So now of course those are not easily available and also if they are available they are very costly. So they don't use it for day to day masks. But it's a very organic process like you said it's like, uh, you know, they make a 
frame with bamboo, uh, which is like it has to be two year old bamboo of the local variety. Right. It cannot be younger or older than that because that kind of flexibility comes according to them right. at that particular age of the bamboo. Then it's they use use very thin cotton cloth huh. clothes then they use a lot of colors uh, which are all natural right. and uh, of course the art is there which is the foremost thing actually right. yeah. so so shooting all of this you know like you you have different tracks right you have interviews with these people then you have them working and all so so tell us about like how long did you take in shooting this film and because it can get a bit boring to keep showing you know workers working so you know that challenge the, uh, how do you kind of overcome that? Yeah, see, uh, when you shoot a craft, I mean, it's just, it takes so long. One mask takes maybe uh, four to five days to make each individual mask because one has to weave it and do all the all the process, drying it and all that. So it's it's actually well, like you said, the shooting is very you know long and sometimes very boring for the filmmaker also. What is the, what is the also. word for it? Slow. slow. Lahe lahe. Lahe lahe. <laughs> we are known as the people land of lahe lahe. You know, everything goes slowly. But I think it's also, I mean, people used to laugh at us for that lahe lahe, but now it's, I think, a uh, contemporary society's living statement where there is a slow movement, right? Yeah. Slow eating, slow tourism and all that. So we have an advantage in that if we can actually propagate that. Since it was this film has been produced by IGNCA, Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts, so they also have this documenting various crafts, right? So the idea was to document the process at the same time make it into an interesting film. So pure documentation is very long and very academic and all that. So all the footage which I procured, the primary shooting was uh, nearly three weeks. I have given all the footage to them for documentation purpose which they can use for research purpose and all but then I also had a structure of weaving a story out of it so that everybody can you know uh, enjoy watching the film while also learning about the knowing about the craft. My cinematographer would get very annoyed sometimes because I would tell him that you keep on shooting this guy you know making this <laughs> and while I'll go and sit in the corner and maybe scroll my Facebook or Instagram so you're like you guys are enjoying only I'm working I, yeah, said, yeah. I said yeah it's your you chose this profession so you jello <laughs> 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 um, you chose to make a film on uh, Muradabad uh, in the one that was just shown so you kind of put the romance back in Muradawar with your lyrical film, so... Uh yeah, I think there's a romance in craft, by and large. There's, if you look at it from a filmmaker's point of view, but if you take it from the artisan's point of view, it's <laughs> drudgery, you know? I think it's really the most tough thing for a craftsman to be a craftsman, you know? But we as filmmakers, we try to place craft in a play, in a milieu which is beautiful, which is attractive, that place may have the. I mean, he may be working in the most ugly conditions, but we like to show that there's a there's a legacy to this craft, you know, and that legacy to the craft gives it a, an edge over the craft or craft itself. You know, my mother's grandfather was from Muradabad, so Muradabad has been a kind of a, something that always drew me because it's on the way to Nenital and used to pass through Muradabad and so Muradabad had a strange fascination for me and I used to hear stories of my mother's great grandfather Nawab Bijju Khan, he was uh, a freedom fighter and he was burnt alive in a lime kiln yeah, yeah. and his body was dragged around in Muradabad so I just feel that that lime kiln and his burning of the body, that flame is still alive in the people, you know, that uh, to do things with their lives. You know? I think it was one of the first films I attempted. And then I think every craft that uh, I do as a filmmaker or as a designer or as a painter, I look at how I can create something different, give an additional dimension to it. So Maradabad gave me an idea of how to do things with, with my hand and be a participant in the craft. So I just designed this buckle, you know. It's a equestrian symbol. Oh, right. Yeah. I yeah. did 10 of these, you know, and made it <laughs> myself. So I, wherever I go, I try to make a design statement of that craft. You know? Right. I mean, any city you go to, any cl cluster you go to where craft is there, there's so much nostalgia here. 
Right. I mean, I can't describe it. I mean, all these films that I've made, they're about it's craftscape India. It's a, right. So it takes you into these different pockets of uh, crafts. And unfortunately, I didn't take that long to make a film. No? <laughs> <laughs> I did it in three days, you know, four days. <laughs> But um, uh, these are very craft-specific films. But is this something that you carry in your other film films? In the sense, like you know, focusing a little bit on craft, does it uh, come into your other narratives, other feature films? Mudafar Sahab and Mudpal, if you want to talk about that. <laughs> I come from the northeast, from Assam, and I have been a journalist earlier uh, for about nearly two decades before I switched over to filmmaking. So I have uh, always felt while well, working as a journalist in Delhi that there is so little known about North East, you know, outside. Now, of course, the scenario has changed a lot of, a lot because there are a lot many journalists from North East who are writing about their stories and also because of social media and all. This sense of responsibility also kind of, it gives me the, uh, you know, it's always at the back of the mind that I should, while telling whether it's fiction or non-fiction, I should bring in certain, you know, aspects of the society and culture and all that. So, uh, all my documentary films I have, except for one film which was on the battles of Second World War, which I fought in Northeast Meghalaya, Nagaland and uh, Manipur, except that all other films have got this cultural aspect. There is something or the other which is represented, whether it's music or craft or something. So uh, that's how I try to bring in certain aspects of these cultural nuances in my films. Yeah, yeah I think <laughs> most of my films have been set in Awadh and they've been set in a milieu which didn't exist, you know, been erased by the sands of time. And it's very difficult to recreate a, a time in production design, which is everything is crafted, you know, everything that goes into the frame and every ray of light that illuminates uh, whatever you see is a reflection of that culture. So Umrajan was a, something like that and it there you know those kind of films take a long time just to internalize a, the craft that is going into the film and to in, interna, internalize the soul that is going into the character who has become the Umra. You know. It take, takes about two three years without that kind of deep involvement with the lyrics, with the music and with the... So we are not, it's not documenting as such, but it's really recreating time and space. Right. So Umrajan was definitely a very big journey and like this, I can talk endlessly about Umrajan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you are, um, uh, you're going to make, you're, you're a budding filmmaker, yeah. right? And, and um, so this, was this your first film? I mean, uh, yeah, it's my first film. Oh, it was your yeah. first film, right? Like uh, this experience of of shooting a craft, and you know, is this something which is which you see now coming into the way you visualize films and the way you uh, visualize shooting them, writing them? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I definitely want to incorporate uh, craft or like uh, our folk stories into whatever project that I'm working on. So. Uh, for my final project, I was supposed to make a final film, uh, which I, I'm currently working on, but I decided to um, work on a game design and incorporate the folk stories of Northeast into that game. So I'm currently de developing that. Yeah, right now. How interesting. Yeah. How interesting. Thank you for such uh, enlightening discussion. I would like to ask uh, Musaf Parali Sahabji, uh, you, Umrao Jan, you said that you can talk a lot about that. So if you could tell me a little bit how difficult or tough the production design for you uh, for the film. See, production design is really a dream. It's how you internalize the written word and make it, turn it into light and uh, shade and, and uh, sound, you know. So it's really going in and then connecting it with your own nostalgia. That is the big issue, you know, to connect it with your own nostalgic association with time and space and characters that you know. So to delve into that is a very interesting journey. In fact, that novel is a classic. If somebody jumps into that novel, they'll get drowned, you know, they wouldn't know what to do. So I got it recorded in a very beautiful voice. And uh, 
and I used to work in Air India and I used to go from Juhu to Air India in my little Fiat and I had listening to that sound. So it took me about six, seven months of listening to that story that gave me how to create it in light, how to create it in images, how to craft it in terms of, uh, you know, clothing, textiles, jewelry, and being true to that time, you know, because being true to the time is really important in in certain kind of filmmakings, you know, certain kind of filmmakings which are cinema very tej, you just go there and discover things then and there, you know. But then there is a whole new, different process of recreating an era and using every single pointer that you may have to pinpoint a certain kind of a Reza scene. So that becomes a really difficult, and that's been my whole journey, you know, like even in Kashmir, I was making Zuni and there, I had to drown myself in that culture for two, three years before I could feel in love with the place. Visually in love, you can immediately go and fall in love with the place, you know, but then to get emotionally in love with the place, it's a different journey, you know what I mean? I think it's a poetic journey, it's a musical journey, it's a human journey. But these, I think, are very important driving forces in creating this kind of a uh, celluloid statement, you know what I mean? What will be your message to the youngsters as a filmmaker? How, how do they approach cinema in the future? I think it uh, should be very deeply human, deeply observant. I think that's very important to be deeply human, to be deeply observant and seeing imbalances, you know, because ultimately what is art? Ek santulan hai, ek mizan hai, between humanity and aesthetics. The moment you see there's a, there's a disbalance in that equation, you know that art is going to weather. So for art to survive that balance between humanity and aesthetics is very important and I think the young people should try to keep their bar you know, barometer always uh, uh, receptive to these imbalances in society. And that's what I think makes a filmmaker. And that's how you understand people, you understand what makes their heart beat, what kind of sounds are they relating to, what kind of uh, predicament with nature they have, you know. So there are all kinds of issues that you become sensitive to as a human being, as an artist. I see that you practice many forms of art, like filmmaking is just one, one and then there's painting and then there's so many other things that you do. So how do you, I mean where does that line come from like personal to professional like because what is work and what is for you because I, when I make my films I feel like, like you said get round and I emerge out like three to four years later out of it and then you know, uh, so how do you keep that uh, interest in cinema alive and at the same time find that personal space to kind of navigate your own self and your own process as a being and as an artist. So, if very complex question. <laughs> I mean, you have to be a juggler and a wrestler at the same time. <laughs> but the thing is that you have to see what drives you, you know. I think the human predicament is what drives me. And what keeps me going is my um, ability, I wouldn't say power to sketch, but the ability to sketch, you know. Because I just cannot move without this diary and a pen. I have to keep drawing, you know what I mean. I think that's something you have to keep. Uh, because today, what is happening is that Admi ka jo sabse bada dushman hai, is being rooted in one place, you know, and he's rooted uh, to a computer, you know. Now that computer is really devouring his his creative spirit. He it's absorbing you into a zone which actually is not your calling. Actually. Your calling is a much higher calling. So whenever I work with a designer or an editor in the computer, I feel I'm physically getting disabled. You know, I must keep walking, you know, and creating. So I think the whole question of uh, integrating many art forms is being receptive on every single level, you know. But only then I think you can work with an editor and create miracles, you know what I mean? So creating miracles comes from the fact that your mind is much more agile and much more deep-rooted in the, in the kind of uh, journey that you are undertaking, you know. So, I mean, I try to do that. I have written a book called Zikr. 
which is my autobiography in which I've talked about people, places, projects, and also influences. And craft is the is the underlying undercurrent of the whole thing. Yes. Yeah.